All right, me lover, I'm Josh. Welcome back to the channel and thanks for tuning in. Today, we're gonna to be covering a big FAQ in the relational space, and that's why men cheat. <laughs> now, this is gonna bring up a lot of emotions for a lot of people, and today I'm gonna to help you, as a woman or man, see both sides of the argument, whether it's anxious or avoidant, and use a fantastic case study that's been dug up from six years ago and it's hashtag hurt bay. Now there's a few series of videos if you don't already know what these are and I just want to react to them as I've seen them for the first time and show you exactly a dynamic why a man has become super avoidant, distant and ended up in the worst possible case scenario, infidelity. This is the worst thing that I would wish upon any relationship and we're going to dive into why the dynamics happen and a case study I'm sure is she's live now and she's allowed it to be online so she's okay to be not scrutinized but at least you know observe and i love to use real world examples this is going to be a bit of a journey now i'm going to see with an intuitive eye who is up to blame here and who needs to take righteous responsibility okay so the first video is them for the first ever time six years ago just reconnecting and asking her ex why he cheated so let's rock and roll watch together are you here I did everything. Like what? I had sex with other girls. I did everything. That's a hurtful line, and it's a you know it's a hooking starting point for this whole scenario. It's a good pre-frame to what's to come. We met in school. We met in college. Um, we met in class, and. You really didn't like me. No, I didn't like you at first. A couple years later, we moved into like the same apartment complex. And the first day we both moved there, we like met on the elevator again. It was like a reunion. And then you offered to bring my groceries upstairs. And um, yeah, we spent a lot of time together. Like every day. I would say that you were my best friend. That's fondness. Me too. Let's give a quick pause. So there's lots of fond memories here. This is how all relationships start. There's a honeymoon period and this childlike love, this innocent falling for one another. The dreams come true. And hormonally, psychochemically, we are really attached and bonded to people's attractive appearances and those initial impressions that we give one another. So it seems like they had a real good time at the beginning. And both look really quite joyous, recalling those memories, which is a, a, a good sign. It shows that they can feel. And it's why we're gonna discover here that, that the guy kind of gets painted out to be a villain. And I wanna discover why. I would go through his phone and I would like see text messages or like pictures of girls and then I would ask him about it and sometimes he would lie and just say like oh that's not true you don't know what you're talking about and he said like oh I'll stop but then he didn't Now, of course, we're seeing a tip of the iceberg here, but already I'm noticing an anxiously attached behavior here. Crossing boundaries into other people's phones, journals, or trying to get the truth behind somebody else's back is just gonna create a form of a barrier of distrust, mistrust. And whether that's because he's acting sus, as it were, she may have a sort of a validated reason why she's doing that. But that's only gonna push men further away. The idea that we need to be open and mutually conversing things and bringing it out into this vulnerable open space to talk about it first before doing the super agent investigations because then men feel like their own verbal defense is eradicated is that they perceive you to already make preconceptions of your partner based on the evidence of which you're finding and interestingly just like the confirmation bias works in psychology it's that we're seeking evidence and information to proof and build upon the foundations of who we are if we believe our partner is cheating we're going to find all the evidence possible and snuffing up like 
you know, Scooby-Doo and his little snacks and create a stockpile of evidence for when shit hits the fan. So already this can create a really defensive dynamic especially the guy, he can start to get even more shut off, shut down and spiral into disconnectedness and already sees your grand plan to emotionally potentially manipulate him moving forward. So let's move forward. Again, men play the avoidance manipulation tactic and also use their physical prowess, their physical strength, their aggression and their avoidance as a tactic to distance themselves. And I don't want to stereotype because we're very complex beings, but on the whole, women can tend to be more neurotic, more anxious, more emotionally manipulative than men. So let's rock and roll. One time I went to his room and he had someone else in his room and he told me to leave. And I went back to my room. There's a total change in demeanor. Yeah. There's a slight shame there. The sigh, sighing is a sign that we're trying to release stress. It's our natural instinctual response to releasing something pent up, regretful shame, guilt, guilty feelings. And in this scenario, in the contextual scenario of this is that he doesn't feel good about what he's done. And he's probably likely knowing what's to come. And we're like a little while without talking to you. And then you said something like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do it again. There was kind of a point where things weren't the same. Really? Just like you would always go through my yeah, phone. Here it is. Or my computer. Yeah, I didn't trust you. The chronology of events also isn't clear here. We don't know if the lady in the room has happened before the going through text messages. So let's assume that that happened after going through a text messages. He's figuring out the pattern. This may be where they're playing into the Pygmalion effect. What she already believes about him, he's kind of instinctually being. It's like being the bad kid in school and the teacher always putting you into the back of the class. With that bias about you, they're almost mentally manipulating you to be what they believe you are. And interestingly, if we don't have any consciousness about our being, we can allow them to kind of weirdly have a spell over us and that we start to behave in the way that pleases that person and conforms to their authoritative position. Now, I don't know who's the more authoritative position in this relationship. Hopefully there's an egalitarian relationship, which means we're equals. Who knows the power dynamic in this relationship? And again, a lot is up to you know, perception, it feels like an English class and we're just dissecting what we know. So let's keep going. But what I see is that he's fallen into the identity of now cheater and he's pushing her away. We'll see if there's any remorse here in any body language and response to her sadness. If you would go to that measure to, I don't, to find whatever, why, why wouldn't she just leave? I think I was like stupid. How many times did you do? I, 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 I don't know. If you had to say. I, I wasn't counting. Okay. That's hard. I see some guilt in that behavior. I see him. We'll explore the comment section in a minute because he's painted out to be a villain, but I can see that he doesn't feel good about what he's done. A big reason why men cheat or go down these limits of spiraling is that they don't feel inherently worthy of a deep bond. And I think he's cheated with countless partners. He may ha actually have a preconceived notion that sex isn't as sacred as it should be. That sex is simply an addiction, a way to distract himself from the deep feelings. And it feels like he's already fucked up and he's following himself down a chaotic path that's a road of destruction that cannot be fixed. This is also called the butterfly effect. It's when one event in our life then ripple effects into a fork in the road and it can exponentially go one direction or the other. And it seems like he's taken a devilish side of his psyche. He's taking the impulses. He's taken the saboteur in his mind to the new height. And I think this is just a sabotaging mechanism because she seems quite sweet, emotional. If you're anxiously attached, you tend to have a lot 
to give. You tend to really crave love and hopefully be good at giving it as well. And maybe this sort of innocent soul who's come into his life, he didn't feel worthy of. Whether that's parental figures in the past, whether he had a positive example was in a father figure, whether he had a really gentle relationship with his mother or had sisters and siblings to bond with in a, in a healthy way, then there may not be much consequential feelings. There may not be a responsibility attached to the the ends, as it were. The reality is that we ha we are responsible for the other person's feelings in an intimate relationship. So what I'm seeing here is when we let a good thing go away, because we don't get many chances in life. I think my wife is definitely one of those chances I had to say yes to. It was a fork in the road. I could have let the devilish instinct take me into the single life and non-commit. I committed because I felt this innocence, this purity, God in front of me. Jazzy was God. And God only enters your life two, three times in your life. And if you fuck it up once or twice, it's accruing as you go through life. And it's not to say you can redeem yourself. You can redeem yourself. There's God everywhere, but you need to get your lens correct. And to be honest with you, the consequences of not committing to someone who is willing to love, fill up your cup selflessly is a selfish move. So, this is the guilt feeling you can really feel and it's a dark feeling in here. And I can see that that's what he's going through. He's not totally disconnected from that. He may seem quite avoidant and non-remorseful. We'll get there in a second. But what I'm seeing is the, the first instance of breaking a rule, protesting. His protest behavior was to go away and make flings because his partner was going through all of his private stuff. He was finding a way to jeopardize the relationship because he didn't know how to say it. Men only act, men tend to act what they mean. We can only focus on one task at a time. And so that finite amount of capacity, mentally, emotionally, physically, we know we have a mission. And especially men who are unconscious or unconscious know exactly what they're doing and tend to want to complete a mission. And this mission seems to be, A, I'm not worthy of this relationship. B, I'm protesting because I'm not happy in this relationship. And that can pretty much be the two reasons there. So let's keep going. It had more to do with me just not being able to commit. Why not? Because I didn't, at the time, I really, I didn't want to. Uh. I think just sometimes or we're just, we're not on the same page. Miscompatibility, I think. I think that's true. <laughs> There's nothing that you could have done differently that I think would have prevented it. I think that you did everything that you needed to do to be a good girlfriend. And I was lucky to have someone like you. I don't think you're a bad guy. Because he cheated, I, I forgave you. Here I'm seeing evidence of her wanting to make it work. He's the phantom in her head that she wants to make real again. And this is the, the issue we fall into when we become attached to somebody. We create futures with that person. We try to forcefully create what our imagination has created for us. So if we're fantastical as youngsters, if we're quite dissociative from our feelings in our present moment, we tend to love to future cast into the future. We tend to love to live in our imagination and in our head. And that's quite a typical trait of an anxiously attached person as well. We love to create romantic ideals in our head, you know, from the propaganda we're fed through Hollywood growing up um, as kids watching lots of lovely love stories and stories going wrong. We love to romanticize our men or our primary relationship as a perfect man in shining armor. And it seems like this could be a first love as well when we become super attached to it, making it work. And it seems like they're in a position now where they're best to go opposite ways, but the anxiously attached can give too many chances. If the man is avoidant, if the man is non-remorseful, if the man creates or continually creates human behavior as a pattern of cheating. And you must listen to that intuition. We must listen to this thing that's been designed for hundreds of thousands of years to tell signals of who is to trust, who isn't to trust, and also the intent of people's behaviors. This little dingy bell inside of us in our heart really does understand what's going on around us emotionally. So listen to that. It was hard. 
I think we're like in the first stage of moving on. Which is essentially grief. I think we both kind of accepted for the first time that it's really mm. over. I couldn't, like, today I couldn't see, like, my life without you, but, I don't know, I feel like you hurt me a lot, so. I'm glad she's coming to an epiphany. I feel like you abandoned me. I apologize for hurting you, and I hope in the future we can remain good friends and I get a chance to see you grow into the woman that you're becoming. I don't know how much, oh bless her, I don't know how much I agree with keeping intimate bonds with someone who had such an intimate place in your heart and betrayed you because you're only going to then have the phantom x living in your mind and eating up capacity that actually exists you know you've got to be careful with the chips you invest moving forward into future relationships so now i live in different states and they still talk regularly now that's the boundary you got to use uh, in life and new relationships i think it's always best to create rules when you're departing or you're closing a chapter with somebody it's good to know what's respectable for you you set boundaries you set limits on your communication because you both do need to move on it's a state of grief and it's something he openly admitted at the end there's a few stages and it gets messy there's no coherent pattern of processing grief it's someone who lived with you an identity you shared with somebody and a person you were becoming with someone and to kill that off isn't easy now grief does come in a state of bundle of emotions sadness anger resent guilt and hopefully we get through to the point where we're genuinely accepting of our scenario and this is what they're starting to do and that is the part of grief that we so need to come through too, but it takes time apparently studies suggest that it takes a year to fully grieve some a loved one passing away and the same happens for relationships so take your bloody time if you're moving on from someone i also suggest that when we're lonely and i have experienced this in my own life we fall prey to faux intimacy we accept whatever morsels of attention or affection we get in our intimate relationships so if we're feeling lonely which it may be of a time at uni or moving into a new apartment new change is a really big catalytic movement in our identity we're like oh my god new place new people this is the wilderness this is the arena i would call it the arena is where we're challenged we're an adventure but we can't really stay there too long because we get fatigued we get emotionally drained and we we're trying to find markers back to who we are so we can rebase rehome and get back out into the arena now i in my own life went to bali initially had some beautiful friends a support network a community and people surviving community is how we live today and when my community left after a month there was a few months just after that where i was craving the same connection that i once had and that led me to narcissistic friendships that led me to really kind of unhealthy dynamics in my intimate relationships and also friendships those i don't see anymore and we've sort of moved on in our own ways and i you know hope healing on both parts but the reality is we seek connection even if it isn't something that's compatible for us so maybe at the time they had their honeymoon period and had their best friend zone it was a time when she just wasn't ready it was a time when she should just have patiently waited it out got to know herself a little better got to know her intuition better honed it into a point where she then connected with people who would respect her love to give anyway she would also probably be an easy supply for a narcissist or an avoidant person who wants to fill up their own cup because she seemed quite emotional at the time and finally when men don't feel respected they source it elsewhere so we don't see behind closed doors and it's funny because some of the comments in this section here are saying they still talk regularly that's hurt my heart he doesn't even deserve a text from her oh god we can see which side people are taking the fact that she didn't even like him at the beginning he did everything to make her like him to make her love him just to destroy her trust and beautiful feelings absolute madness now it seems like there's a real female dominated aspect to the comments here who knows who's up to stake here you know and, and i don't like to make 
sweeping judgments. But we don't know behind closed doors if the masculine was feeling trusted, was feeling worthy, was feeling respected. And that's just to say, if he didn't, he may be seeking validation outside of the relationship through sexual addiction. If you've got any questions or I failed to cover anything that you are intrigued by, then do comment below. And by now, if you haven't subscribed, please do, because I'm gonna be posting more to the channel. I'll be seeing you on the next one. And again, fire in any links you want me to react to in the relational space. I'll be seeing you on the next one.